Hi, Chris Heger, Guns.com. Welcome back to Select Fire. We're in Springfield, Massachusetts at Smith & Wesson. Iconic American firearms manufacturer started off with revolvers, but have evolved from wheel guns into rifles, pistols, even shotguns. I'm expecting to see a lot of cool stuff. Let's go take a look. Smith & Wesson is one of the most iconic names in the gun business. Founded in 1852, they've been producing fantastic firearms ever since. Although Smith & Wesson produces a wide variety of high-quality firearms, the classic revolver is synonymous with the company. This tour is dedicated to the Smith & Wesson wheel gun, arguably the finest on the planet. They're produced entirely at their historic factory in Springfield, Massachusetts. We were lucky enough to go on a tour recently and are going to show you exactly how they're made from start to finish. But first, a little conversation with the company's CEO. My grandpa, who was in Vietnam, he had a Smith & Wesson Model 60 that he had tucked in his stuff and he never left, you know, the uh, fire base without it, you know. He was like, I, I had that gun with me every day, everywhere, you know, and, and I've got it now and he's, he's passed, but, you know, that's still like, it's, it's all just tied back together. You see, you get this mental vision of these guys in uniform, generation after generation after generation, they're like, I need something I can rely on, something that's dependable when there's nothing else. You know, well, I've got that Smith & Wesson, you know, and that's, that's big shoes to fill. That's a big legacy, you know. So. It's huge shoes to fill, and, it, it, and it's cool. I mean, to hear stories like that, you know, when you, we're traveling through airports, we get, you know, we'll, we'll, oh, somebody stop us all the time and say, oh, I just want to, you know, thank, thank you for what you do and, and, you know, tell you a story about, and you'll hear some story about, you know, some, some personal connection they have to our brand or that their grandfather had or that their great-grandfather had. And that's one of the reasons we're so passionate about, about the Second Amendment. And, you know, that's our responsibility. And we have a tremendous amount of respect for all of our competitors, but we feel like we got a little bit more <laughs> vested than, you know, than a lot of them, just because we were one of the first. You know, we're, we're one of the rocks of, of, you know, of this industry and, and really of this country. So, again, cool and humbling to be, to, you know, to, to be a part of that and, you know, setting that, that up hopefully for the next generation and, and for the future. So. Gotcha, gotcha. It's always nice to have the CEO take time to talk to us about these tours. Without further ado, let's get this tour started. Our tour guide is the one and only David Ducharme. All right, Chris, welcome to the Smith & Wesson factory floor. I've always wanted to come here since I was a little kid. Right, it, it's an awesome place. I work here every day. Some days, honestly, don't tell my boss. I wonder why they pay me. All right, we've got over 600,000 square feet of manufacturing space we're going to see today. Wow. So let's go check it out. I think you're going to love this. Awesome. Now we've toured quite a few gun factories over the years, but none of them has the following area that makes Smith & Wesson very special. All right, Chris, this should be a pretty interesting part of the tour for you. Let's grab some safety gear and welcome to the Smith & Wesson Ford Shop. So everything in here is, is hot. <laughs> and it looks like they're running a big hammer today, so this is a good treat. The materials have come out are just a little over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So each hit progressively expanding the material and shaping it into a revolver frame. When it's all run down, they'll punch off the, the scrap material. The rest of it will run up a container over here. And from here, they'll run back to heat treat to be annealed to draw them down so we can do some machining on them. This hammer runs the 500 frames, 1911s, all the big revolvers. Because of the cost of heating these things up, sometimes they'll run them for a couple days and then shut it down. How cool is that? Not too many gun companies have their own foundry. This allows Smith & Wesson to control quality right from the get-go. Now, let's see how these lumps of metal are turned into beautiful guns. All right, we're standing at the beginning of our revolver frame machining operations. So what I have here is our, our forgings as they come from the forge shop here where they're ready to start running on our CNC machines. Gotcha. To show you the differences in some of these revolver frames, you know we have various sizes. I've got an X-frame for you to see. Oh, that's, that's pretty significant be, there. 
<laughs> That'll end up being either a 460, uh, Smith & Wesson 500, or a new 350. Yeah, that feels like a cinder block. That's, right, that's and in comparison, here's a scandium frame. That's our J-frame size. So that'll end up being a 340 or you know any small caliber J-frame pocket pistol. I, I can't stress like the, the difference in weight between these two. Like this is like you know it feels like holding a cinder block, whereas this is like an empty aluminum can. You know, at scandium, especially with like a J-frame or something, makes a huge difference. So we're in revolver A cut. We saw the frames as they come from the forge and they feed into this area to run on all of these CNC machines. Be careful, it's a little sharp on edges, but you can see the first cuts of a Smith & Wesson revolver. Yeah, it's starting to, to not just look like a, a lump of metal, you know, but actually revolver shape. Uh, what do we have here, Dave? Is this well, like yeah, a cylinder I'll give you one guess, what do you think? Uh, looks like a cylinder. All right, it uh, has something to do with the cylinder. This is gonna be a yoke. Holy crap. So we start again with a big bar stock. It'll be rendered down to, to yoke size, if you will. Running the machine behind me and behind you. And once it comes out, we'll have a, a bin full of chips that weighs about as much as the yoke as our end product. You see, we drop a lot of material to get that yoke. So you guys take, take all this and shave away till you get down to that. Right, the yoke's a very important part of our revolvers. The cylinder rides on the barrel of that yoke and then that's going to be fit to the frame and stay with the frame for the life of the revolver. All right, Chris, we're coming into an area of the factory where all our revolver barrels are manufactured. Okay. So this is some examples of our, of our blanks right there from a raw stock. So what is this like for an L-frame or something? That probably would end up being, yeah, L-frame, maybe a 686, 686 plus yeah, or something to that effect. You can see the top rib so, and you can see the, the bottom lug and correct. everything. Correct, this is a traditional one-piece barrel. I'm gonna show you right over here, the machine that's running them. So here's where we went from a blank to an almost finished part. We still have some exterior cosmetics to machine, front sight cut. And it's going to need the rifling. Gotcha, gotcha. We do a brooch cut for our rifling. Gotcha. Those were the one-piece barrels. What about the two-piece barrels? Right over here, we've got an example of a two-piece barrel. Okay. So this is a shroud. Gotcha. So we would have the barrel be a separate piece called the sleeve. Okay. So the sleeve enters from the muzzle. It'll thread into the frame with a special tool that actually engages the rifling to tighten the barrel. Okay. And this one would also get a barrel nut on the muzzle. So we saw the last operation of machining and now the gun's getting a yoke assembled into the frame and it's, it's fit to the frame as you can hear them hitting it. They're making that yoke swing freely. That yoke is now gonna stay with the frame throughout its life just like that side plate did. And then it's gonna come over here to these polishers. We've got various operations for polishing a revolver frame, and these guys are just about as close to an artist as you can be. This, this is not an easy operation. Yeah, you were telling me these guys, they dress their own wheels and everything. That's correct. They maintain all their own wheels. They dress them at the end of the shift, so that the next day they're ready to go. Uh, it's, it is somewhat of an art form. You can't just take anybody and drop them in this department and have them be successful. It, it takes a certain touch. This is where you get that really good quality Smith & Wesson fit and finish right here. All the hand finishing operations. We'll do another operation, which is a tumbling operation for a final finish of like a 686. If it's a performance center, they'll go on for additional finishing. As a revolver lover, this tour is out of this world. I'm surprised at how much love and labor goes into making Smith & Wesson wheel guns. No wonder they're such a pleasure to shoot. We're in one of our main polishing areas for our revolver cylinders. We still do some manual operations on this cylinder. We polish our flutes by hand, and then this cylinder is going to get fed into our robot, which can polish at various degrees. So if we're going to have a matte finish, it would end up just like this. You can still see a couple of the tooling marks from the cutters, or if we're running a high polish, it's going to get the additional treatment of not only the belt dressing, but it's going to get the polishing wheels, which are going to give you a nice smooth finish. 
So it's amazing to see that a lot of this stuff is still done by hand, you know? A majority of our polishing operations are, are done by hand. Because right, it's, uh, it's like a feel type of thing. It is. It's, it's definitely skilled work to, to run this flute and not roll these edges over and have a nice consistent finish from edge to edge at the end of that flute. It takes a craftsman to look at that and be like, okay, this is right, rather than, well, this isn't right. By touch, by feel, by knowing your belts, your abrasives. So Chris, we're continuing our tour. Now we're in revolver assembly where the barrels and the frames are gonna to come together. We saw them all through manufacturing, getting our side plates, getting our yokes fit, getting polished. And now we, we get to the point where we're gonna thread a barrel on. So a traditional barrel, one piece, as we call it here, we'll get threaded on, clamped in a barrel fixture, torqued down, and then set the top dead center for your front sight. On a two-piece barrel, it'd be on the opposite side of this operation. We saw this in revolver barrel department. You've got your shroud, and then you've got your barrel. Gotcha. And this is for like a 500? That would be a 500. So then the barrel tool will be installed. We'll thread this into the frame. This is located off of a notch of a male section on the frame. So our front sight's always at top dead center. It torques it from the front all the way through to the back. Good deal. Very great, very good design. This is our finishing room. We run various finishing operations depending on the material. Over behind you, we have a penetrator or, or black oxide, our bluing operations for our carbon steel frames. Okay. Anything stainless steel will get this passivation treatment, which helps it prevent from corrosion. Gotcha. Over behind me, we would see our anodizing operations okay. for our aluminum components. It's at this point that the revolvers are assembled. This is done entirely by hand. The skilled workers make sure that the guns are working perfectly before they get test fired. So Dave, you guys have a bunch of shooting ranges here too. We have many shooting ranges. We're in front of B range right now. B range is where all of our revolvers come in, all of our pistols, some of our shotguns will be fired here. Uh, we also have a long gun range as well. We've probably got six or seven guys in there running right now. So how many thousands of rounds do these guys shoot every day? Oh, on a given day, I mean, you might get a couple thousand rounds before lunch easily, sometimes before break time. It, it sounds like a great job, but it becomes work. <laughs> it's a tough job for somebody else. It's to do still it. a great job. Gotcha, gotcha. Once guns have been successfully test fired, then they're ready to be packaged and shipped. So Dave, you guys run like a 24-7 operation here, huh? We do. In the, in the factory, we, we run about eight shifts total throughout the plant. The assembly area, which we're in now, runs two shifts, and so does our testing area and our packing area, which is what we're standing in now with all these beautiful piles of firearms. So we can't leave this area, Chris, without you taking a look inside one of these babies. Oh, 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 look at that. Oh, that, oh, that sweet 500 smell. And there you have it. That's pretty much how a Smith & Wesson revolver is born, grows up, and then heads out into the world to make people very happy. Oh. Of course, once a gun leaves the factory, it's followed by a lifetime warranty. We're here with Lena uh, with Smith & Wesson's customer service. Uh, Lena, how, how long have you been with Smith & Wesson? I've been with Smith & Wesson for five years now. Nice, nice. And what do you do with customer service? Um, we provide an array of services, uh, engraving services, uh, frame replacements, uh, technical support. Uh, we provide sales of products um, and any other questions that the customer may have. What happens if somebody has an older gun, like the, the original owner of a gun bought in like 1989 or something? Is that still covered under the warranty? Or? So what we cover is manufacturer defect and worksmanship. We don't cover normal wear and tear, which sometimes can take place if it's as old as 1989, um, but they would fall under the lifetime warranty policy. It's very much situational dependent, so the gunsmith would have to have the gun here, evaluate gotcha. it, and depending on what the issue is, we'll, we'll take it from there. Yeah. And we're looking at the parts bins back there, and you guys have just a tremendous amount of parts for revolvers and, and rifles and stuff going way back. How, how far do you guys support stuff like that? Um, we can support uh, a firearm as old as 1960. Nice. As long as parts are available, we'll, we'll make it work. What's your favorite Smith & Wesson? My favorite Smith & Wesson is actually a Model 41. Oh, nice. Yeah. Those are great. Performance Center Model 41, to Those be exact. Great. Yes. 
They're just so fun to shoot, man. They, just they are. There. It's a fun plinkery gun. Yes. Very smooth. You may have noticed Lena mentioned engraving. Yes, Smith & Wesson still offers engraving on some of their firearms. Now we're not talking about run-of-the-mill laser engraving that any machine can do. We're talking about the real deal. Chris, this is some exciting stuff right here in the factory. We're outside the booth of our master engraver, Dave, and his new apprentice. These guys are awesome. Dave does old school engraving. He's chasing a hammer and a, and a, and a chisel. And the newer guy is, is professionally trained in an engraver school. And he uses an air chisel. I don't know a lot about it. So come on in. Well, my name is Dave Mishashik. I'm an engraver here at Smith & Wesson. And, uh, and this is kind of some of the work that we're actually we're doing here. This is a cylinder for a, a, a 357 revolver. I'm actually handing the reins over to my partner, uh, Sam Gloy. I'll be retiring soon. And uh, he actually does it a slightly more modern way than I do it. And this is something that's timeless. You know, you don't see it very much anymore, but they've got it here at Smith & Wesson. I think that's what really struck me about touring the Smith & Wesson factory. There's a coming together of both old and new. There are some old school machines on the floor, and then, right next to them, are state-of-the-art machines that measure to the hundredths of a thousandth of an inch. This blending of old and new technology comes together to produce the best of both worlds. What do you see Smith & Wesson in 10 years? Well, hopefully continuing to, uh, to flourish and, and grow. And, you know, I mean, again, we've been, we've been part of this great nation for so long that, you know, it's, it's our duty and our responsibility to make sure that we're setting, us up, setting the place up that it's better off when we left it than where we found it. And, you know, so part of that is that move to Tennessee. You know, we look, we look at, uh, you know, the environment, unfortunately, for manufacturing firearms in, in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, which has been our home for all 170 years is that that's changing, unfortunately, and you know, we're, we're looking to make sure that the company is set up for success you know, going forward for the next 10, but next 170 years, and you know, looking for an environment where you know, people respect the Second Amendment and where they respect you know, what we do for a living and, you know, and have an appreciation for, for our business and our industry. Well, there you have it. That's our tour of the original Smith & Wesson factory in Springfield, Massachusetts. While we focused almost entirely on their classic revolver lines, Smith & Wesson obviously produces so many other great firearms. We plan to focus on those products when we tour their brand new factory in Tennessee next year. So please stay tuned. Well, that wraps us up here at Smith & Wesson. Hope you guys had as much fun and saw as much cool stuff as we wanted to show you. Really can't ask for anything more. Tune in for the next Select Fire. So, Mark, what's your, uh, what's your favorite Smith & Wesson? It's got to be a 629. Oh, is that yeah. right? The, the, oh, that's a classic. The, the classic. I mean, that's a great guy. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Part of, uh, it really, it, it, we talked about a lot of the history of Smith & Wesson. You know, that's that's part of modern history of Smith & Wesson, right? I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. There's, there's, there's no other gun that people think of and immediately associate with the brand than that one. So. I mean, it's a crowd pleaser, you know. Big, stainless, what's not to like, right? You know?